and they go out and they trigger alarms, we have auto ticketing, all sorts of stuff that's helping us drive it. But now we're refining ourselves into a new world. This is IP now. This this is you know John is gonna uh, John's gonna go over the fundamentals of how all this stuff works. And then we're gonna basically come back after he's done talking, then we're gonna explain to you how we're measuring stuff today. So IP video today, which we call either, we call it at the end of the day, it's like a manifest. So it's HTTP, dash, and again, John will be describing some of that stuff uh, in detail with his uh, with slide deck. But he'll, he'll show you how video has evolved to even a higher, a higher quality, higher standard, more flavors. Yes, back in the day, even just till three or four years ago, it was one format. You took the video, it went out to the customers. If you had a iPad, you had a phone or whatever it is, and you're streaming some video into it, it's the same picture for that as it is for the big TV. Now today, we have multiple formats. We, for an HD signal today, we have five different formats that we put out, five. So this starts out with the highest bit rate, all the way down to the lowest bit rate. But we're providing different signals at different qualities to fit the appropriate product. So that also increases a lot more challenges with, you know, obviously with monitoring and, and all sorts of stuff. So I'm going to uh, ask you guys to uh, welcome John uh, from Tektronix here, and he's going to walk through a uh, uh, walk through the new uh, IP video uh, scheme. And, talk about EBR and, and all this other stuff that relates to IP video, and then we're going to come back and then we'll uh, talk some more and then we'll have some questions. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for uh, having me here and uh, let me kind of go through some of this stuff. As you can tell, I've been in this business for a very short period of time. Anyway, so I've been in, I, I want to come from long. So anyway, so uh, I've been around for quite a while and I went through that experience. I had a chief engineer told me, if I ever catch you watching some other signal other than ours, you're fired. That was the first first day on the job. So you know, so one of the things that we used back then was intimidation of losing your job if you didn't watch the television. And sometimes you you if you're not yeah, if you didn't like the material, you had to watch it anyway. Anyway, and uh, actually I did find when I used to do QC work. If I didn't like the program, I did a better job of QC because I didn't get interested in the program. I paid attention to the video itself. But if you got interested in the program and the story that was going on in the program, sometimes you forgot to actually look at the quality of the video. So it's an interesting, uh, and so that's why we need something better than people to figure this out sometimes. But anyway, so when we talk about quality over. Uh, uh, over the top kind of stuff for IP, like they kind of break it down into three sections that we're kind of looking at. We have to look at the ingest and the encoding of it. So the original material, because you know how it is, garbage in, garbage out. So if you can keep the noise, the signal noise and everything down on the input side, you use less compression algorithm and it gets a better cleaner transcode. So we take this in and then we transcode it into multiple different streams. And then we actually have the screening the silk out itself. So when we break this down, you can break it down into two time things we're looking at. We're looking for the quality of experience. This is looking at the overall thing. What's the person watching it thinking of this program? What is their experience? Are they annoyed? Are they going to change channels? Or are they going to watch it? And, uh, and so a subset of that are you know, quality of service. This is sort of that last mile. The connectivity to the person. Are they getting that signal there? Is it breaking up because of bandwidth issues or some sort of mechanical issue of that stream itself? The quality experience could also just be bad encoding, uh, audio too loud, audio too soft, distorted audio. So this is the overall experience the person's having. This is the service we're providing the connectivity to that particular signal or uh, device they're viewing it on. And so when you usually look at this, usually the streaming stuff is part of this quality of service, and then transcoding all like that can be more of the quality of experience kind of rhythms that you're looking at. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about the AVR, this uh, adaptive bitrate, because that is the most challenging thing to monitor today. Because as we were saying before, we now have to monitor a lot of stuff. When we use the AVR, you could be monitoring up to 16 different essences of that same program because I don't want to necessarily use the same encoding for with my big screen at home as I would for this here. I can have a little bit lower bit rate hit feeding him and it would look good, but if I take that same and try to put it on my big TV at home, it wouldn't look so good. So we have to have these different rates depending on what we're looking at. And so we look at it, and one of the nice things about ABR it's different is it actually is using HTTP. So it allows you to get through the networks that we have today in people's homes. So there's not a lot of special stuff to make it work here. It's client-based. The client is going to decide and tell us what bandwidth we have available to us. And so that's how we need these multiple bit rates, multiple representations of the same signal, so we can select what it is based on the signal that we have it. If I'm using Wi-Fi here, I have a higher quality signal. If I'm going out and I'm using my G3 or G4, I might want to use something a little bit less band with intensive. So we'll move forward. And so we're looking at that capability. We're going to break the signal up into segments. So as I move through the building, going from Wi-Fi outside to 3G, I will change automatically to the lesser bandwidth signal to compensate for it. So that adds more complexity to it. Now I had to be able to do that switch without breaking up or people seeing a difference. Because one of the things I found out over the years being in this business, the less people know that I exist, the better quality the signal is. You know, if I do my job well, I'm an unknown person. Okay? If I have people, I used to work at a post house, a proper post here for a while, we did streaming and all that stuff. But if anybody was in the edit suite and I would walk in, they'd immediately say, oh no, what's wrong? You know, so, you know, but if they never saw me, if I did my work in the background, everybody's happy. So, you know, so if you're an unknown in your business, you're doing your job well, okay? So, just be aware of that. Uh, so, the challenges here is, well, we want to make sure we do our job well, so that the subscriber is satisfied. They don't have to be talking about who's called technician wife. If my wife is asking me what's wrong with the signal, I know there's a problem. And so, you know, so, you know, she's my, anyway, so, but, you know, but here again, we don't want that happening. We also, we do it because the content we're sending out, that's money. There's an advertisement in it, that's money. If we lose that, or we lose that stuff, that reduces the income to our place that we work. Not a good thing. So we got to, that's our challenge is get this thing in there with uh, with little technical difficulties possible. So we look at the adaptive bit rate, you have the high bit, and then you do the switch, you could switch to a lower medium bit rate, to a lower bit rate, and back up again. And so at these switch points, because what we're doing, we're sending out chunks of the video. Say the movie is broken up into like 10 seconds, sections, and each one of those is a file. And they load in one file, and while you're playing that one, another one's being brought in. If it takes more bandwidth to bring in the second one, well, it drops down to a lower bit rate to bring in that next one. So we have these, and so we may switch between those. We want that to be invisible. We don't want people to see the technology. We just don't want them to watch and see who just got killed on Game of Thrones, right? That's all they care about. They don't want to see the technology or the dragons break up as they're going to fire. So anyway, so that's what we got to try to do. So we're going to break those things up. So if you look at a system, this is an AVR system. I take, the, I, uh, I take my signals coming in and I convert it. And I would make it uh, add any uh, uh, digital uh, rights management information in there. And I make it into these fragments. And then I send it out. And these people will grab and use the streams that they need for their facility. Let's go a little more detail on this. So here, I want to make it. I could make up to 16 copies. Now I got 16 copies of something to check. Not only do I have to check that, so 
So when you take a look, you can see these could be different bit rates. Got different bit rates, different resolutions. I don't really need 4K here, right? Because the resolution, I'm just not going to see that much information. So here, I'm going to use the bit rate that I can get away with a lower bit rate here, and go lower resolution. So we want to keep the quality of the experience of the client high as they need it to be at the lowest bit rate possible. And you kind of look at it in a different way here. If you look at it, depending on the device that you're looking at, the probable bit rates you'd want to use, the resolutions you'd want to use. The challenge is, now I have all these streams. They've all been encoded and transcoded separately. But I may have to switch between those streams. So if I go from one stream to another, you know how MPEG is. You've got to have information from the uh, frame behind it in order for it to decode. So we're going to come up with these IDRs, which just means anything past that, we're not going to use anything that's in the buffer, it's blown out. We're going to start there. So each fragment starts with a fresh stream, with nothing dependent on the fragment before. You kind of look at it like this. In MPEG-4, we kind of do this. Uh, we make these P and B frames. So this information is what's different between those two. So I got this picture and this picture, and then this one is going to be what's not in those two. So we don't have to carry all the information. We just have to carry the main frame and then what's different between this frame and that frame. And so that's how we get a lot of compression going on here. But if I had to reach back here and get information and I start here and switch, then I'm going to get some issues. And not only do I have to do that, but I also have to make sure that each of the streams, these lined up in case I switch between them that it's a clean switch. And so you take a look at it. Generally these things are going to run about every five seconds. It's also going to depend a lot on the GOP, the group of pictures, where they start and stuff. So you're going to depend on that depending on what we're going to do. And if we get it wrong, it looks like that. We didn't get enough information for all this stuff, so this is a telltale sign that, oops, we're missing not all the data. We lost a frame or something in there has happened. We don't have all this information. So this is what we don't want. MPEG has always been that tough thing to do clean switches on, so you have to do it on those iframes, IVR frames, because you don't want anything dependent on what stream behind you, because as you change between these continuous. Everything makes sense there so far? So now I've got these streams and I got them all encoded lined up where the iframes are matched up. But now I want to make frag uh, fragments out of it. So I want to take this and I want to add this encoded boundary point. Okay, this is going to be the point that's going to make the start of each of the fragments. So I'm going to mark up a frame saying this is the fragment starting here. And so you can see, not all the iframes necessarily get it, but I'm going to say this here. That means that's the first frame of the next fragment. This is the first frame of that fragment. And as you can see, it looks something like this. And so what will happen, while you're playing this one, you may be encoding this one or maybe you have a couple ahead, but you're, this one's being loaded in in order to play next. And if it takes longer to bring this in, it does to play that, you have to step down to the next bandwidth and get the next one down. So your bandwidth can handle it. Make sense? So this is what we're trying to do, is figure out how to do this. Now how do we, and I'm going to show, kind of go through how we check that to verify that these, this, this information is all set up correctly. Because as we make things more complicated, we make more things more easy, more things can go wrong. Just try working on your car these days, right? So, 
And then we kind of go back into here, this area. Once we've gotten through this, into here, I now have all those streams. So how do I manage those streams? How does my device decide where they are and how to pull them in? Because think about it, each movie is broken up into about 10 second segments. And each one of those segments is a file that has to have a URL to, to grab and pull in. So how do we manage that? So every one of these trains system, every one of these movies has what's called manifest files. The challenge here is we have multiple of uh, that bit rate for, uh, formats. So we have our friends at the top, Apple. They have theirs out. It's the most popular right now. The least popular is probably Adobe. And the one that a lot of people are moving to is this uh, is what we call Dash, adaptive, uh, dynamic adaptive streaming over each, uh, TTP. Anyway, and the reason they're that's being popular, one of the reasons is it doesn't have a manufacturer's name on the front of it. See, it's not Dolby, it's not Microsoft, and it's not Apple. It's independent of a manufacturer. That's why it's all mostly used in Europe. Europe doesn't like to use stuff that uh, is manufactured, one manufacturer only kind of system. Uh, so it also is the most flexible of the group. There's a lot of stuff put in there. It does a better job with the ad insertions than the others do. So there's a lot of nice things in there about it. <coughs> but the common thing about all of them is we're all using that H264. Okay, audio is the AAC. And they all have a manifest file of it, one type or another. So we all have to have something to keep track of these files. And in that manifest file, the number of representations, it could be 1 to 16. So how many representations do I have? How many different options do I have here? <coughs> then you have what is the bit rates of those? And the resolution of those? And where is the URL located to request those? So this is all pertained into that manifest file. So when you first load a movie, you're really loading that manifest file, which is now going to tell me how to get the other stuff. And before I could do that, I had to go to a digital rights management if there's anything tied to that or not. But to prove that, yes, I do have an account with Comcast. I can watch this. And this is an eye chart. You might look, take a good look at it in about two seconds. There'll be a test on it. So anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm not going to go through this. It's just on the slide deck to be there. One of the things I got kind of highlighted is that the typical segment derivations are different, slightly different for each one of them. Manifest files are also slightly different between them. If you take a look at the, uh, this is the Apple version, HLS. You can see that they kind of, they have a, what they call a playlist actually in their system. So they got each of the clips out and they ready to pull it in and makes, they develop a playlist out of there. And they use a particular, uh, this IETF uh, graph format is what it is based off of. A little different than anybody else's. Dash, here, they've actually added the ability to go to the uh, H265 uh, in the future. So it's gonna be future, expand out that way. It also can use MP, uh, MP4 as well as the MPEG, uh, transport streams. Its manifest file is an XML file. So it's different. And uh, and like I said, this is the one that's used in most countries in Europe because it's uh, the most independent. And then Adobe Stream, here again, it's uh, slightly different than the others. And this is an example of what a file looks like. You can see each one of these is a different bit rate, or a different resolution, different, uh, they're all using the same Kodak. But you can see, and it's all, this is like here of uh, 
steel, and this is a, shows me all the different clips on that. So anyway, you see that how much data or how much information is actually carried in this stuff. To be able to point to whichever fragment you need at this time as the movie goes through. Kind of a mind boggling. So now when your chief engineer points at that and say, all right, you gotta check all that stuff. Look for a typo right there. <laughs> so you know, this is the challenge that we have. Is this is just getting beyond what a person can do. So we have this really complex thing. So how do we monitor it? How do we figure out what we have is going to, you know, not going to cost money, and we're not going to lose money doing it. How do we actually be able to put this out? Well, what we can do is break it up into two different kind of formats of signals. So right in here, this preparation like this, this is common for any kind of streaming application. We have this kind of technology, we, we have to do that. Then over here, this is going to vary a bit depending on what kind of, this is over the top, or is this a video on demand kind of stuff? This could be different. But the goal here is, I want to be able to look at my transcode. And this is where I'm going to look at my quality of uh, service and quality of experience. Quality of service metrics is my bit rate. Am I getting any di uh, discontinuity? Well, is the signal actually present? So then over here, these metrics, they're blocking and tiling. We have ways of measuring that. We can actually measure the energy energies around those squares of those, those uh, squares to see how much uh, blocking level there is, the audio level. Uh, over compress, we can measure that. Closed captioning. As we move more into uh, the system, the FCC is requiring cable company and streaming companies to support closed captions more and more. You know, when I first got a deal five years ago, the screen had to be larger than 13 inches before you even had to worry about closed captions. Now I had to worry about it on this. You know, for me, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't be able to read it anyway. So, but here again, when they start looking at metrics like this, people you know, just, just can't do it well. So we have to kind of come up with methodologies to enhance the ability for people to be able to QC this stuff. Technology, so here again, we're trying to make the technology so people just don't notice it. Here again, we kind of bring these out into codes, similar to the I, IT guys where you actually see, which we're looking for is 200. So everything's successful. They went in, grabbed the file, and it played back. If it didn't play back, was it a client error? Was it a server error? Those are the kind of things we're looking, trying to identify for you. Any questions on what, what I've gone over? How we're kind of mechanism going through doing it? There's a lot of details we get into, so but uh, don't want people to die of uh, uh, PowerPoint fatigue. So I'm not going to go deep. Yes. With closed captioning, is there any? Uh, from the, you know, like, the content legible? Not yet. That's one of the things I think we should be, we should, I, I personally think we should at least put a spell check in there and see that 80% of the words are spelled correctly because, you know, there's going to be those <laughs> words that nobody knows that, oh, someone's name or something like that, you can't check, but, you know, it seems to me that there needs to be more automation capability in that. Yeah, I, 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 even, even in the file-based systems, I think there should be better. That no, we I, should I, do better. I honestly think that with closed captions, that Everyone knows the FCC. We all deal with the FCC. This is our business. So, one of the big challenges that we have is that the FCC requires that closed caption be on on the old architecture. At least seventy-five percent of systems, uh, or a, a broadcaster or a system, has to have closed caption on seventy-five percent of the time. Right. All new broadcasters, as of and I can't remember the day off the top of my head, but after a certain date, which was uh, several years ago, it had to be one hundred percent. 
So one of the challenges that we all see today is that, and uh, you guys out in the field might get it too, they'll, you'll go into a customer's house and they'll say, why is the closed caption all garbled? And they'll say, you, you go in the head end, you'll say, oh, it looks fine to me. And it's the way that yeah, EIA 708 or 608 is being decrypted by that particular CPE or set top or, or TV or whatever it is. And that's a challenge for us. And this is, you know, and this is why we're, you know, Phil is asking, is there something come up? Because that is a very time consuming, very- the, One of the things that we found in the baseband world of, uh, when we're checking QC, I used to do that. One of the things we found out is, is uh, if someone takes a progressive signal and goes to an interlaced signal, it gets trashed. The, uh, the digital version gets trashed. The 608 version doesn't get trashed, but in, when digital TV came out, they made a Cadillac version of closed captioning, where it was uh, positioning and all these, added all these tools, color, and all these different things. And so the problem is, is it's, it's based off of frame rate, okay? When you go to interlace, all right, the frame rate is still the same, but the, the, the rate is half the frame rate as before, so they have to double it up or narrow it out. So if they don't convert it and just copy it over, it gets corrupted. And this has been generally the biggest problem we've had at broadcasters in that the, the originator, the 708 version is busted. But also carried in that 708, there should be a 608, which is the old analog style. It's, it's like an old Chevy. It just doesn't die. It just keeps running. You know, where you got this nice, you know, Porsche that they're running here. It's all these fancy things, but you got to put the right gas in it or it sputters. Here again, you got this old system that just sort of works because it's not very fancy. So one of the things to check for that thing is, what I think we need to do is be able to check the, have it automatically check the text between 608 and 708 and see if we can catch some of those things. That's the simplest thing to do. After that, then I think a word check kind of addition on there would help going too. And uh, so those are the things that we need to be able to do. The, problem, uh, the other issue they're having is the FCC wants us to make these things to be not only it be there, but it be in time. And when, when it's said, they want it to be shown. Well, yeah, how do you do that without a person looking at it? Here again, this is where AI is going to eventually solve the problem. You know, but at this point, you know, how hard, do, you know, how do we do that? Those are the kind of challenges we have, because here, think about it, I got a newscaster, he's talking, someone's typing at the same time, why? Well, you know there's going to be a delay. I actually know one news channel in Oklahoma that actually has their local <coughs> news on a delay in order to give that person time to have that synchronized. Wow. So those are the kind of things we have to think about moving forward. They're not enforcing a lot of that right now, but when they do, Lines are going to come out. So lip sync as well. Yeah, lip sync, lip sync. You know, and, you know, like when the cannon goes off, it should, 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 should say boom. You know, kind of thing. You know, they should be in time, synchronous. Uh, they, the other thing, it needs to be complete. And you know, because sometimes it takes longer to make the closed captioning, so there has to be a little trail at the end of it, so closed captioning can finish before you set to the next scene or the next show. So those are some of the things that you have to worry about. And this thing came out in 2014, I think, is when they this edict came out. So just so you guys know, person, you know, whenever you guys see that person talking and then you feel like it's not in sync, our the human eye can perceive that and the brain can perceive that within milliseconds. And, uh, and I, you can literally see it. And that's how close that timing has to be. It's not a second. A second obviously would be giant. Right. We're talking like milliseconds that you can actually perceive someone not talking at the rate. And I think everybody here has heard that before. And it's not something that's usually present in the old days. This is something that's new as we keep going. Well, it's, it's something that occurred in the digital world because one of the things that's, that's right. unique in the digital world is audio can be before the video. So we're all very used to having an audio delay and people in the back of the room are hearing me slightly delayed from here. You ever been a golf course, you see them swing and hit the ball, and then you hear the ping? So when I went, you know, you'll just see a, a, a rocket take off at the Space Center. You'll see it come up and almost be past the gantry before that sound wave hits you, you know? So 
these things we're used to seeing. What we're not used to seeing is the ping before the swimming. We're not used to seeing audio before video, and that occurs in a digital world. And so that's, and the people will notice that even faster than if it's audio delay. It's less than, almost less than the frame there. So it's, uh, there's a big difference between the two. So those are the kind of things we need to look for, and this is where we need companies like us to actually come up with ways to do that. And how do we do that? You guys need to tell my bosses that's what you need. So, you know, so, and I'm old enough not to worry about what they do to me. Oh, you know, Bradford said, you know, that's okay, I don't care. Anyway, but that's, those are the tools that we need moving forward. And what we need is a priority from you guys. Which tools do you need now? What we're trying to do now is create, because what our best thing is that we're working on what we, we think you need. You need to tell us if we're not working on the right stuff. And so that's the challenge for us, because our tools are for you. And so if we're not doing them and the, giving you what you need, then let us know. Because there's a lot of power in this room. There's a lot of users in this room that don't, you know, can tell us and they can move our priorities fairly, fairly well. Anyway, so thank you. Any other questions? Yes? From a technician, and I know that we have techs in the field, for this scenario that yeah. that gentleman was talking about, the timing being yeah. off, is there any type of piece of test equipment that we could troubleshoot in the field to bring back to the component level of what might or where that problem might originate from? One of the issues with MPEG is their timing is based off a thing called PCR. And if you look at, P, uh, if you look at the, the PCR clocks, we actually can flag an error. If PCR gets out of time. Actually, if you look at our tools, I can bring one up and show you. But then there's a tab there that says PCR. We actually track and measure those things. And what happens is, those drift off. Have you ever seen the timing off and you change channels and you go back and all of a sudden it's clear? Yeah. That's because the internal clock in the decoder or in your uh, Comcast box got out of sync between audio and video because it's a presentation time code compared to decode time code. Because what happens in MPEG is we have these I frames, P frames, and B frames, right? Right. Well, we have to transmit the I frame in order to build all those others. And then we have to, so they, they don't ship. All, it's depending on how long your GOP is, we don't send the frames out in the order that they're supposed to be displayed. Right. So audio has to sit in there churning, waiting for video to get its act together and get in the right order before it comes out. If those clocks are off, synchronous, then all of a sudden the audio is coming out before the video is ready. So, to follow up with that, just to make sure, because we do get these complaints yes. where the customers <coughs> complain about this. Are you saying that we should reset the box, or is it something in the, could be something in the network such as an First thing I would suggest to tell a client to do, can you change the channel and go back and see if it clears up? Really? That, that resets everything. So that, that resets that MD PCR yep. okay. clock alignment. And generally, nine times out of 10, that's gonna solve the problem. And okay. why does this occur? Any kind of uh, interruption in the transmission or the box can th could throw that off. So, Anything else? So the feedback on what he was talking about, Rob. Uh, so any kind of signal impairment, even though it's slight, maybe an uh, error correction, intermittent error correction could be thrown out off constantly. So having to change the channel constantly could be that could be it. Yes. Well, if if, you're, if that's happening all the time, then you have an underlying problem in that going to that box. Either the box has got a problem or a stream going to that box has a problem. You know, whether it's a connection to the thing, the, the level's too low, it would cause this to get out, would be my opinion. So what I would do, if you have a client that's constantly having this problem, I mean, you know, five, six times a day, you might want to do more investigation. If it's like in my house, it happens maybe once a month at the most, usually not that often. My wife says, it's off, change channel. Is it okay? All right, don't worry. So it, error correction is a lot has a lot to do with transport rather than the fundamental signal. So if you're starting to see errors, tra like uh, error corrections, uh, V Solomon type errors uh, in a house, 
that usually has relate is related to whatever the transport is that's needed. Because you got to remember what we're talking about here is the the source, as you would say. The source has modified itself over the years, so it, it's changed. And then when in the old digital world, we we have all that stuff. We bring it in, and then we modulate. It. We have to get it out somewhere because right now it's just packets. So it's just data. And I know what the new the the new world with RemoteFi, everything's still changed. But at the end of the day. It's just a different point of where it's being modulated at. So when you are going out to the last mile and we have a transport issue, for example, you start getting errors. Those errors are related to how those packets receive cleanly to the CPE at the end. If it's a marginal signal, if you've got MER issues or, or whatever, those packets could be received and are out of order from the transport stream because it's throwing up errors. Error correction obviously tries to correct it. And that's what error correction is. They'll say, okay, instead of packets one through 10, getting there from, it's getting one, two, three, four, six, eight, nine, whatever. They'll say, okay, error correction says we need to jumble it around to break it back into order again so it works. At a certain point, <coughs> there's correctable errors and uncorrectable. Once they're corrected, everything's good. You won't even notice anything. But uncorrectable, that's where you start seeing missed packets and so on and so forth. And in this new digital world that we have today, these chunks that we're talking about, these chunks are, you, you get a, a big error enough in one of those chunks that well, however the duration of that chunk is, you're gonna lose that whole chunk right. until the next IDR frame comes in and, and resets the thing all over again. That's how the, this kind of this new world's gonna work. Um, you'll still have tiling within if in the transport side, but if we lose a chunk at a customer, it, at the source side, as that manifest comes in, you're gonna lose that whole, set, that whole fragment and then it'll start back over again in the next frame. So it, there's a lot of difference, and you know, and, and we're all sitting here talking about um, these technology. I mean, we, we literally went from the Flintstones to the Jetsons within <laughs> like five years. I mean, this is how, or, or five, 10 years, this is how crazy it's become. And I know that all the stuff that John was talking about here is, it's a lot. And you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know video was that complicated. It really is. It's now it is. And that's the need. John's talking about, you know, what, what do we need from you? What, how, how can we help you? And these are the challenges that we have every day. We talk about closed caption. We talk about error rates, lagging. I mean, I know that we've had issues in the past with, uh, you know, you start getting lip sync delays on uh, certain types of boxes when we had, when we were first launching uh, the new, uh, the new uh, manifest product, the HTTP stuff. And that's all challenges that we've, uh, we've been experiencing, which is new compared to what we had before. So everyone that's old enough to remember analog, you're like, oh my gosh, nothing can be worse than analog. And when digital comes out, it's gonna be perfect. Because it's digital, it's just ones and zeros. It's exponentially crazier because those ones and zeros are now, we're, we're trying to make more and more and more space to put more and more stuff into. Right. We're having to come up with new ingenious ways how to transport that. And the customer demand is so huge right now about having to make sure, oh, I need to watch it on my phone. Oh, I need to watch it on my phone in one hand and on a TV on the other one so I can go, like if I turn my head, I can still see it, you know? And, and, them being sync. and with them being in sync on top of that. So these are all these new challenges that we get, and we are coming up with new, new ways to monitor things. And there's a couple of things that we're going to be touching on here in the next uh, presentation that, that uh, Brian and I are going to be presenting. But you see that video is now something that is, it's, it's beyond what you guys probably have been able, anyone that's been around the business, like I said, have seen the evolution, you're like, it's still video, I still see it on the TV, it still looks great. And as John was saying, our job is to make sure that you guys don't notice the difference. It's just the same. I mean, yeah, the picture quality is better or whatever it is and, and so on and so forth. But it's still video. We're still like ESPN, HBO, whatever, still looks good. You guys don't know that it's different format that we've been transmitting in it for the last, you know, depending on what platform you're on. If you're, you can be on an IP, all IP platform, you can be on a Quantum platform, but all of this stuff that's our job to make sure it goes seamless. And that's all of this monitoring stuff. And it gets so complicated, the more and more we compress it. And we have to be better than YouTube. We have to be better than all these other stuff, which are kind of, they're not using any saving technology, but it's somewhat similar. It's, it's a digital IP stream packet that's going in chunks, that's going to your iPad. And I, 
everyone here has kids knows that they watch YouTube all the time. And if you're sitting there watching it, you can see it either looking like great or it can look like garbage. So there's nothing in the middle. There's nothing in actually, the middle. Actually, no, there is. There's nothing. nothing. There's actually nothing yeah, in the there's middle. There's nothing in the middle. That's all. And actually, the pictures that look the best are the raw, the worst content. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he doesn't know how to he doesn't know how to write a script, but he knows how to make good video. You know, so, yeah. so th this is some of the challenges that we have. To. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate okay, it. Okay, no problem. Thank you. As uh, as Brian's getting set up here. Uh, I just want to just reiterate, you know, that when we're talking about digital television and digital stuff, we're talking about QoS and QoE and group of pictures and, and all this other stuff. We have to reduce the bandwidth. We're all, 